In 1957, the Cunard Line had a problem. For nearly two decades, they dominated the transatlantic passenger trade with the RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth. Despite their legendary status, these two great liners were increasingly becoming relics of the past as passengers opted to cross the Atlantic by plane. If Cunard was going to maintain their dominance, they would need a replacement. They knew that an ultra-modern superliner would resurrect Cunard's greatness and keep passengers crossing the Atlantic by sea for the foreseeable future. They were wrong, but nearly a decade of planning later, these plans would create one of the most beloved liners of all time, a liner that would somehow manage to carry Cunard into the 21st century. Now before we get into the QE2, let's take a quick second to dive into this video sponsor, Blinkist. Between my full-time day job and my passion of researching and making ocean liner videos, along with my feeble attempts at a social life, I don't get nearly as much time to read as I'd like to. That's where Blinkist comes in. Their library of thousands of books across a wide range of genres offers all the major points of a book in an easy to digest audio form. Their summaries run around 10 to 15 minutes and I can listen to them anywhere, whether on my commute to work, at the gym, or while I make dinner. If you like this channel, you're probably a naturally curious person like me, and you'll probably love Blinkist. I love it because I'm able to learn about topics I ordinarily wouldn't have time to read about. One of my recent favorites is Sea Power, The History and Geopolitics of the World's Oceans by Admiral James Stavridis. It gives a fantastic summary of how oceans shape power and politics something that I don't get as much time to research as I'd like to. Blinkist is also a great way to find books that I might want to buy later if it sounds like a topic that I want to dive into deeper. And they even offer summaries of podcasts called Shortcasts, so be sure to check that out. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for the Big Old Boats crew. Click the link in my description, that's www.blinkist.com slash bigoldboats to start your free seven day trial with Blinkist and get 25% off a premium membership. I'm really excited to partner with Blinkist for this video and I hope that you'll support them in this channel by giving them a try. All right, back to the QE2. The Cunard White Star Line emerged from World War II in a powerful position. RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth were the two largest and most revered ships in the world. Their biggest competition, the French Line's Normandy, was a burned out hole laying in a scrapyard in New Jersey, and the German and Italian competition was similarly destroyed by the war. With two complementary vessels, the Cunard Line, which dropped White Star from its name at the end of 1949, was able to offer a consistent express service that dominated the market. By the 1950s, the company operated 12 liners that sailed to the United States and Canada. But as the decade continued, problems began to mount for the company. Mary and Elizabeth were aging. The two great liners were becoming deeply inefficient and maintenance costs were mounting. With new competition from the lightning fast SS United States and plans formulating for the ultra modern SS France, it was clear that the Queens would need to be replaced if Cunard wished to stay competitive on the Atlantic. At the same time, air travel was quickly creeping into their market share. Plans for the new queen actually began taking shape as early as 1951, though serious planning for the new liner, codenamed Q3, didn't start until later in the decade. While warning signs were mounting that Cunard's core business would soon unravel, Q3 was initially planned largely as a modern take on the traditional transatlantic ocean liner that would take over for the older queens. But Cunard's board of directors was bitterly divided over what direction the new project should take. In 1960, plans were taking shape for a 75,000 ton liner with accommodations for 2,270 passengers in a traditional three-class configuration. 
But instead of being built at Clyde Bank like her two predecessors, Q3 was initially planned to be built at Swan Hunter and Vickers Armstrong. The British government agreed to lend the project 18 million pounds on the condition that the liner provided a traditional three-class express North Atlantic service. The flawed plans for Q3 had a similar exterior appearance to Holland America's Rotterdam and probably would have been launched around the same time as the Italian lines Michelangelo and Raffaello. These designs lacked many of the touches that made those ships and even the SS France and SS United States adaptable to cruising. While the plans for Q3 were technically very advanced for the time, they would have locked Cunard into a ship entirely devoted to the rapidly crumbling transatlantic market and would likely have yielded a commercial disaster for the company. Fortunately for Cunard, in late 1961, just before building contracts were to be signed, Cunard's directors yielded to concerns from management that the plans were too traditional and put a halt to the project. The considerable changes to the transatlantic market between 1958 and 1961, when more than half of those traveling between Europe and North America were now choosing to travel by air, no doubt helped make this decision. The market dominance Cunard enjoyed for decades was quickly evaporating. It was becoming clear, even to the traditionalists, that in order for the new queen to have any chance of success, they would need to go back to the drawing board. Plans for Q4 called for a slightly smaller liner that was both capable of the speed and durability required to maintain a transatlantic route, along with the versatility that would allow for cruising during the winter months. Initially, she would be 58,000 tons, but her size soon crept up as the plans were developed. The design team led by Cunard's naval architect Dan Wallace pushed for a two-class configuration, but the majority of Cunard's management continued to feel that a proper transatlantic liner should have three distinct classes. Though they were devoted to tradition, nearly every aspect of the new liner was evaluated and scrutinized to fit the modern era. From the outset, her plans included many features designed to entice the rich, including a full garage accessible through a side hatch. Jets might be a lot faster, but they certainly couldn't compete with the ability to take your car with you. A building contract was finally signed with John Brown of Clydebank on December 20th, 1964, with a price of 25 million 427,000 pounds, and a delivery date of May 1968. Her keel was laid down July 2nd, 1965, and she was designated hull number 736. She was the largest liner to be built in the country since the 83,673-ton Queen Elizabeth nearly a quarter of a century before. Through Q4's planning and construction, Cunard's position grew more precarious. Jet travel was surging and passenger numbers were plummeting. The already struggling industry was thrown into further disarray when the National Union of Seamen in the United Kingdom called its first national strike since 1911, calling for better wages and a 40-hour work week. The strike caused major disruption for British shipping and had enormous adverse effects on the UK economy. During the six-week strike, Cunard's liner sat idle, costing the company millions. The strike had a long-lasting impact on British shipowners and led many, including Cunard, to rethink their costly operating models. It's hard to overstate just how catastrophic the situation was for Cunard. They entered the 1960s with 11 passenger liners and ended the decade with just three. Initially, they planned to keep the RMS Queen Elizabeth in service until 1975, but even after extensive refits, the liner was running virtually empty even when the line experimented with sending the giant liner on cruises. Her traditional transatlantic design left her ill-suited for the role. The older Queen Mary was retired at the end of 1967, and Queen Elizabeth sailed her final voyage in 1968. The success of the Q4 project was now life or death for Cunard. These mounting anxieties led to constant changes in her design. To drum up publicity, it was revealed that the Q4 would be the fastest liner on the Atlantic, though the rapidly diminishing competition made this feat feel a lot less impressive than it would have a few years earlier. Her hull was launched on September 20th, 1967. She was christened by Queen Elizabeth II. 
Q4's name was kept secret until the moment she was christened. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth II. May God bless her. May God bless her and all who sail in her. There is some debate on whether the liner was meant to be named after Queen Elizabeth the Monarch or RMS Queen Elizabeth the Ship. Cunard's website stated that she was not named after the Queen from 2002 to the ship's retirement in 2008. But according to Sir Basil Smallpiece, chairman of the Cunard line at the time, there was a desire to name Q4 after the Queen, but the monarch's name was traditionally only used for naval ships. So it was decided with counsel from the Queen's private secretary that the name would be just Queen Elizabeth, replacing the retiring RMS Queen Elizabeth. But when the Queen announced the ship's name, she took the liberty of adding the second. Whether or not this was a mistake is not entirely clear, but Smallpiece was delighted that they could use the name they wanted. But it was felt that using the Queen's name in advertising would be improper, so the numeric two was used instead of the Roman numeral. The Queen soon approved of the styling. Queen Elizabeth II had her name, though she would commonly be referred to by her nickname, QE2, throughout her career. While Queen Elizabeth II was built to maintain tradition, her builders were determined to create an ultra-modern liner. Her interiors and superstructure were designed by James Gardner. He gave her a sweeping yacht-like look and a gorgeous modern interior. But the design choice that made her well-suited for the shifting industry almost didn't happen. From Q3 to Q4, there was a sharp divide over whether she would have a two-class or three-class configuration, with many at the company demanding she maintain the traditional three classes. But as her fitting out began, a series of disputes with the workers at Clydebank delayed the project and led to a series of quality issues. Cunard was forced to transfer the ship to Southampton, where Vosper Thornycroft would finish her fitting out. In the long run, these setbacks would prove fortunate. During this time, the decision was finally made to give the liner a two-class configuration. This gave her the versatility she needed to compete in the growing cruise market. Another sign that Cunard was looking to distance the QE2 from previous liners was the controversial choice to give her a thin white and black funnel, but they would thankfully return to Cunard Orange in a refit following the Falkland War. Shout out to her many weird ass funnels. When completed, she would come in at 65,863 tons, though later refits would increase that to 70,327 tons. She measures 963 feet in length with a beam of 105 feet. Her original steam turbines would generate 110,000 horsepower and had a service speed of 28.5 knots, and she could carry 1,820 passengers. Her sea trials began on November 26, 1968, but it was immediately clear that she suffered from vibration issues resulting from design flaws in the blades of her steam turbines. Cunard refused to accept the vessel until the issues were resolved, further delaying her handover until April 18, 1968. Her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York took place on May 2, 1968. Despite coming into service at a difficult time for ocean travel and a series of mechanical issues, the QE2 proved popular with passengers. By the late 1970s, she was operating at around 65% occupancy which was just enough to cover her operating costs, but every day that she wasn't in service cost the Cunard line 80,000 pounds. The company had no choice but to keep her at sea on passenger voyages as many days out of the year as possible. This meant that maintenance had to happen at sea, often at ports of call during the day while passengers were off the ship. This caused reliability for her three boilers to become a serious issue. By the 1980s, the modern cruise market was taking shape and an old rival, the SS France, was relaunched as the SS Norway by Norwegian Cruise Lines. She was optimized to capture the new cruise market and retook her position as the largest passenger liner in service. QE2's ability to adapt would soon be put to the test. In 
1982, a 10-week war broke out between the United Kingdom and Argentina over the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. The Kiwi-2 was requisitioned by the British government as a troop carrier on May 3rd of that year. She underwent conversions in Southampton and was equipped to carry 3,000 soldiers and 650 Cunard crew. She departed on May 12th with only one of her three boilers in operation, while her other two were brought back into service during the voyage south. Despite the danger, she successfully returned to Southampton on June 11th, greeted by the Queen Mother on board the royal yacht Britannia. And in a strange move, in her conversion back to a passenger liner, her hull was briefly painted a pale gray. This was short-lived because it was ugly. Soon after her return to passenger service, the QE2 experienced a series of mechanical problems and an electrical fire in October 1984, causing Cunard to cancel and delay several cruises. Some consideration was given to replacing her, but it was decided that it would be more cost-effective to undergo significant refurbishments than building a brand new liner. She was sent to Bremerhaven on October 27, 1986 for the work, which included converting her from steam to diesel power. The 100 million pound refurbishment included the installation of nine diesel electric engines, new propellers, and a heat recovery system, all cutting her fuel consumption in half while maintaining her speed. Her passenger accommodations were also significantly altered, unfortunately removing much of her original designs. The investment ensured that she would sail for at least another two decades. In the mid-1990s, she underwent another major renovation, codenamed Project Lifestyle, which again significantly modernized her accommodations as she was becoming more and more dated compared to the competition. In 1999, she celebrated the 30th anniversary of her maiden voyage. But as the century was drawing to an end, it was clear that the classic liner would soon need to be retired. In 1998, the Cunard line was acquired by the Carnival Corporation. At the same time, plans were taking shape for Cunard's latest queen, a massive modern transatlantic liner would complement and eventually replace the Kiwi 2. After the Queen Mary 2's maiden voyage on January 12, 2004, the Kiwi 2 handed over her iconic transatlantic route, but she continued to sail cruises. On September 4, 2005, she became the longest serving Cunarder, surpassing the RMS Scythia. While the Kiwi 2 had a devoted fan base who still love her to this day, her time with Cunard was nearing its end as the line ordered two more modern cruise ships. On June 18, 2007, it was announced that the QE2 had been purchased by a Dubai-based investment company for $100 million. She departed Southampton for the last time on November 11, 2008 on a farewell voyage. This also meant that QE2's permanent resident, Beatrice Muller, who at age 89 lived on the liner for 14 years, would need to find a new home. She truly lived my dream retirement and went on to spend her final years on other Cunard ships though she always maintained that Kiwi 2 was her favorite. After several years of anxiety that the ship might end up being sent to scrap and campaigns to bring her back to the UK, her new owners opened her as a luxury hotel in Dubai, where she can still be visited today. The Kiwi 2 is a survivor. She lasted from the late 1960s through to the 21st century, when, unfortunately, time finally caught up to her. Ships are a window into a moment in time, and no matter how hard Cunard tried to make QE2 a ship of the future, the future almost immediately caught up with her, but somehow she sailed on. She stubbornly carried tradition into the modern era, and she is the reason we can still book a transatlantic passage on a Cunard liner today. Against all the odds, she managed to survive, and people love her for it. She's truly a special liner that has earned her place in history. Thank you so much for watching and a huge thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Seriously go check them out, it really helps out this channel and I wouldn't be working with them if I didn't think they had a really great product. If you like this video, do me a solid and hit that like button, and if you haven't already, uh, maybe, uh, you know, subscribe. It'll make my day. Alright, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.